Thank you, Ian. Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you all. Very welcome, Silt Park. Um, and it gives me enormous pleasure uh, to, to welcome Ange to Celtic Park today. Um, we've been waiting to welcome her here for a little while, the joys of quarantine, um, and I could not be more thrilled. Um, you may have heard from the, the feed upstairs a little bit about the process, but um, it's, uh, when we're looking uh, to chat to Ange, um, looking at his background, looking at his experience, looking at the way that he sets his teams up, um, it, was, it was a fantastic conversation that we had together. So I couldn't be more thrilled that we've, we've secured Ange. Um, you're going to get to hear a lot about him, I'm sure, over the next 15, 20 minutes and in the, the, the years ahead. Um, but I, from a personal point of view, as someone that's spent a lot of time in Australia, a lot of time in Japan, uh, the experience that he has and the uh, warmth of affection that he has over the, that part of the world is probably shining through. You're probably seeing some of that just now. And that shows you how highly regarded he is internationally. So um, I'll maybe hand over to Ange, and once again, welcome, Ange. Thank you, and uh, thanks for the warm welcome, everyone. And uh, as I said upstairs, uh, uh, super excited and uh, very humbled to be in this position. Um, well aware of uh, the size, magnitude, and, and the traditions of this football club. And my role here is to hopefully um, yeah, create some more special moments and, 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 and create things that, that last well beyond my tenure here so that uh, my time here is, is remembered and uh, uh, remembered in a special way. So I look forward to what's ahead and, and uh, I guess my main task is to make sure that uh, I keep all of you very, very happy over the next period. So um, I'll be working hard to do that. So thank you very much. Hi Ange, welcome to Celtic. You'll find that they're at the best football club in the world um, pretty soon. And the people you were speaking to up the stairs, they're not your friends. Um, the people on here are your friends and there's a lot more of us and we'll always be with you. Um, but please be straight with us and be honest with us um, at all times. Um, we can take defeat and don't like being cheated and we don't like being let down the way we have been in the last 12 months certainly. Um, there's referees in this country who support one team, compliance officer supports the team, and penalties for one team, um, three retrospective red cards last season. And look at these things. Don't do what Tony Mowbray did and take it on the chin. He did that and that was a, an open goal that was exploited and he didn't last very long. And so please, the Celtic supporter with you, and, and uh, what you said about up the stairs about mixed, it was never mixed about you, Ange. It was never mixed about you. Um, and right away, the Celtic support found out everything they could about you. And I've not met anybody or spoken to anyone who's not 100% behind you, and also Dom. So the very best of luck. It's not really a question, but there you go. I uh, appreciate it. And um, what I will say is that I will always, always protect the interests of this football club always against anybody um, so um, I can assure you that um, I won't let anyone uh, take advantage of, of this football club my interests lie here so I will protect it with everything I can Brilliant, thank you Can I ask that um, it's questions because we're quite tight in time yeah. Do we just yeah, keep it right back First of all, guys, once again, thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, Dominic, this question's first for you. Uh, last season, fans have seen very little accountability and poor inconsistent communication with the supporters. As a CEO with a background in communications, will engagement with supporters such as this event today continue to be such a high priority after season tickets have been sold? Hi, Erin. Thank you for your question. Um, Hopefully today demonstrates my openness and keenness to engage, and that's going to be a cornerstone of my administration. Um, as a Celtic supporter, I spent my whole life supporting this club and feeling connected, um, and I want to make sure that the connection that I enjoy growing up supporting this club continues whilst I've got the, the huge opportunity to, to lead it. Um, so absolutely, connectivity between ourselves and the support is utterly vital. 
And I maybe said earlier on that one of the most important things I think that we need to try and grapple with is getting supporters back into the stadium. I've really missed it. You've really missed it being in and amongst friends and colleagues watching the, watching the game. So I think we're making some good step, step, steps forwards. The Euros have been really positive in terms of having crowds back in there. And you can see the energy that the players get from that. So um, that is the ultimate piece of connectivity, getting supporters back in. But in terms of making sure that we're able to keep you updated and listen to you, we'll definitely want to do that. Absolutely, thank you. And on that note as well, uh, on behalf of the Kano Foundation, once again, a massive thanks uh, for the season tickets. That is a, a huge step towards amazing progress, so thank you. Um, and it's an absolute honour uh, and welcome to Scotland, first of all. It must be quite a, quite a transition in terms of the weather, but I'm sure you'll, I'm sure you'll, you'll fit in quite well. Um, my question for you is, uh, during the week you had said that you want to entertain the fans and you want to win. But to win, that doesn't just take you, that takes a whole background team. Do you plan on appointing your background team? And if so, when? Yeah, um, again, there's definitely going to be a change in the way we work and, and, and the way we train and the environment. Um, and the people who will be in that environment would be the ones who I think um, can drive us in the direction I want to go. So... Um, Will there be changes? There will probably will be changes. That doesn't necessarily mean people will be going. We might be bringing other people in. Um, but I'll make those decisions um, over the next few weeks once I get a, a good idea of the people that are already in place. There's some good people in, in the football club already. Um, you know, the, the club had a lot of success uh, for a very long time. Um, you don't want to discard that um, knowledge and experience uh, because of what happened last year. Um, but we're certainly heading off in a new direction. And... Um, I'll find people that will help us uh, go in that direction. So I'll, I'll make those decisions over the next few weeks. But you can be assured the people that will be working with me um, will be going, will be pulling in the same way that I am in terms of the kind of football we want to play and the kind of football club we want to be. Absolutely. Thank you very much, both of you. It's an exciting time and thank you again for your time. Uh, hi Dom, hi Ange, um, Aidan Connolly from the 90 Minute Cynic or the cynic.co. Uh, firstly, I want to thank you both for your time today for putting this together. I think it's great that fan media get access like this and I think it's a really positive step. And obviously everyone in this room and everyone at the Cynic wish you both all the best. Dom, if I could just ask you a question first, if that's okay. Just want to know how you've found uh, the handover process between you and Peter. Obviously you've come in a little bit earlier to start that handover. How, how involved have you been in the day to day over the last few months? And is there any... Uh, do we expect any involvement for, from Peter here on in? Um, great to have you here. You're very you. welcome. Um, so the handover has been fantastic. It's been a bit of a whirlwind. My first day in the job started with the European uh, Cup effectively disintegrating, if you remember that. Um, that didn't last too long. And I, I said to the team, I said, does it happen like this every Monday in, in football? And they said, it's not quite as bad as this, but it's a bit of a roller coaster ride. But what I've found in the last five or six weeks is that we've got a brilliant team here. And they're, they're utterly committed to bringing success back to, to Celtic. Everyone is in, has enjoyed the success. I've been really disappointed with, with last season. So I've got a great team that want to go again, go hard to make sure that we have got success. So that, that's really important to me. Um, Peter's been great in terms of the handover. Um, as you would expect, he has achieved an enormous amount over his 17 years. Last year was, of course, a disappointment for everybody at the club. So the handover has been really, really positive. I fully start on the, on the 1st of July, but it'd be fair to say, um, like all incoming chief, chief executives, you want to make sure that you put your marker down relatively early, and I've been offered the opportunity to do that by the board and by Peter, so hopefully today's another s small, but simple expression of some of the things that we're beginning to do. But bringing Ange in was a key thing that I wanted to do, and I was given the opportunity to get actively involved with that and then leading that process, so um, I couldn't be more delighted to be sitting right next to this guy just now. Thank you. Ange, eh, I'm thrilled to have you here. I've done a lot of research, as I'm sure all of us have. I've heard you speak a lot about your principle of playing, how you set your teams up in the way that your father would have liked to watch football. And I think a lot of us resonate with that with Celtic fans. Heard a lot about things like you've highlighted possession, high tempo, energetic press in football, entertaining football. You'll hear Celtic fans say the Celtic way a lot. I think that's what that is, and I think we're excited to see that. Last season, I feel like, personally, we always found ourselves 
have a lack of ideas when we came up against teams who came to stifle our attacking play who set up in that low to mid block made it really tough for us, particularly here at Celtic Park. I just wonder if you could give us an insight to how you would expect to set up tactically to beat teams like that. Yeah, thanks for that. And I, I do appreciate it. I mean, I, I did say I, I may have got a mixed response upstairs, but I, I guess that's just uh, people, and I'm not on social media, but people feeding me information about what was going on on social media. So uh, the reality of it is since I've been here and, and the people who have reached out to me have been super supportive. Um, and, and I've got no doubt there isn't... Every Celtic supporter wants me to do well and wants me to succeed. I've got no doubt about that. And I know I'll get their support. In terms of the football... Um, it is a simple thing, but it's it, for me. It's the most important thing. So you mentioned that it's it's my, my father passed away a couple of years ago, but it's I try and play football. He'd love to watch. You know, he he I was I'd sit by his side. You know, five years old, and we'd watch football from his side of the world at three or four in the morning, just me and him. And uh, he'd always point out the entertainers. He'd always point out the entertaining team. He hated Italian football at the time because it was all defensive, and and that just you know got into my brain and, and I've, I've tried to do everything I can since then to create special things like that. Um, the challenges we're going to face, A, is firstly just you know getting our guys to believe in that. Um, it's not an easy way of playing football because you've got to be really brave and courageous in, in, in the way you go about things because you're not going to be fearing any opponent. You're going you're gonna to be taking risks, but I've got no doubt that I can make them believe that. I've made every football team, uh, I've, I've managed to do that. And then we inevitably come up with, with opposition who will try and stop us. Um, but within that, um, I have full confidence that football we play and the relentlessness of what we do, um, once we get to a certain point, it won't matter what the opposition do. You know, We'll find our ways to, to overcome because the biggest part of that is that you really believe in something. Yeah, and, and, and it's not just believing in victory because everybody wants to win. There isn't a club manager player in the world who doesn't want to win. If you can believe in something stronger than that, and mine is in a certain way of playing the game, then you don't let anything stop you. Not the fact that it's the first minute, the last minute, whether you're winning, you're losing, whether the opposition is sitting back or they're pushing onto you. You believe in something greater than that. And um, that's where I've had my success in, in, in getting a team to play in a certain way, but also in believing in that method. So um, there's no doubt we'll, we'll get some challenges, but uh, once I get the buy-in from the players, um, I'm confident we can overcome them. Thank you both and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, both. Nice to meet you. It's Natasha Miko from A Celtic State of Mind. Um, Dominic, I'll come to you first. Um, there's been widespread reports of a restructure of the footballing department as a whole at Celtic. Um, and we know that Nick Hammond has resigned, that Peter Lawwell's leaving on the 1st of July. Are the club looking for a director of football, as has been reported? And how are those searches going? Hi, Natasha. Thanks for the question. Um, so my intention, I think we maybe mentioned this previously, is to, is to make sure that we evolve and modernise the club. So what does that mean? What that means to me is looking at every single part of the club, whether that's football, whether that's business, whether that's engagement, and making sure we are benchmarked. Are we the best we possibly can be? Are we world class in these areas? Whatever area that might be. And if we're not, then let's become world class and go on a, a journey towards that. And if we need to enhance and bring people in, we'll do that. So the football structure, as you mentioned, uh, there is, is an area which is obviously something I'm, I'm very interested in. And I'll look across the whole of that football structure and I'll engage with Ange on that. One of the great joys of bringing Anjan is a great experience in Japan, great experience in Australia at club level, but also international level. So together, we'll look at that sort of football environment and we'll make the right decisions for the, the club going forward. There's clearly some roles to fill, but before I, I trigger any roles, I want to make sure I've got the right long-term structure. And I've spent a lot of time over the last uh, number of weeks speaking to other clubs across Europe, making sure I understand their structures, what's working, whether that be in a recruitment, whether that be in an academy, whether that be in the football operation structure. So we're, we're learning, we're looking, and we'll make sure that we make the right decision. But the benefit, I'd say, of having Ange in here, in here is I'll tap into his experience too. Thanks, Tom. Is Ange helping you with that structure? Is that structure not yet finalised? Is that what you're telling us? Yeah, so I, again, I don't start until the 1st of July. Um, mm. A bit like Ange, people have been kind enough to give me lots of ideas and feedback. I like to think... Um, 
I will always listen to that, but I've got to make a decision that's right for the football club for the long term. So we've not defined anything yet, we've not finalised anything yet, um, and we'll do that when it's right and proper. The focus, the critical focus for us as a club right now is to bring in Ange, bed him in, make sure that that football environment that he's currently in just now is working, and then we'll build things out. Thanks, Dominic. And I'll come to you now with a question. Firstly, welcome to Celtic. It's great to have you here. And as has been touched on, we all give you our full support and we will for the season. Um, obviously, you're acutely aware that Champions League qualifiers are just around the corner. And a lot of the fans' concern is that there is a lot of work to be done in such a short period of time. What's your assessment of the amount of work that needs done? And what assurances can you give the fans that we have enough time to do that so we won't be going into these Champions League qualifiers underprepared? You know, I'm just as concerned as, uh, <laughs> as everyone else. Um, it, it, it's a great challenge for us, no doubt. Um, and, uh, you know, with, as I said, we, we've got some challenges at the moment, um, particularly with, uh, um, you know, our squad. Uh, but we're working hard and I kind of said upstairs, the way I, I work is uh, I'm not looking too far ahead. Um, what's most important to me is that the, the work we do today is the best possible work and, and so we can be ready against like uh, against Mitchell in the in the Champions League. I know how important the game is and I know how anxious the supporters are for us to to, to do well. Um, I know it's important um, you know for for the club itself to show that we're, we're heading in a, in a new direction and I'm well aware of all those things but I can't control what's going to happen in four weeks time. I can control what happens today and tomorrow and for the next sort of 20 three, four days, I think it is, that we've got before that game and I'll make sure we're as ready as we possibly can be. Um, but there's no doubt everyone in the club is well aware that we need to make... You know, we do a lot of hard work to get the squad to where we want it to be and um, everyone in the club is, is working hard towards that. Uh, so, um, you know, I can... Uh, what I will assure the supporters that when we come out here um, for that first game, um, you know, they'll see a Celtic team that... that will already have elements of the kind of football I want to play and more importantly belief in something um, that hopefully will make a special come uh, in, in sort of the years to come. Thanks Ange, great to have you here. Thank you. Hi Ange, hi Dom. A uh, question for you first, uh, Dom. Um, you uh, Brexit's going to be a massive impact on, on British football. Uh, you've touched on it just there. How much are we going to be uh, prioritising the academy in terms of CapEx expenditure in the next wee while, if that's a route we're going to have to take to, to bring more players through? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, first question I've had is incoming Chief Exec on Brexit, so thank you for that. Um, I guess it, my, my point earlier on was that we want to look at all parts of the, of the organisation, including the academy, to make sure it's world-class and make sure it's ready for the next 10 years. So we need to evolve that, modernise that a little bit further. We'll absolutely do that. I think one of the exciting developments is the opportunity for the B team and the Colts team to move into the, the Lowland League. That gives game time, that gives opportunities for players and for coaches and backroom staff to, to challenge themselves in a slightly different environment. So I, I see that as being a critical component for Celtic to keep investing in and keep developing. They've had success in the past, of course they have, but we've got to make sure we keep investing in that going forward. Thanks. Uh, Ange, um, you, in your, in your book, and as was mentioned earlier, we've all been doing the research, so you, t you talk about the culture at uh, Melbourne Hellas uh, as being important in the culture of a football club. We've got, uh, we are very proud of the culture of Celtic um, being formed and uh, to put dinner on the tables, and one of the driving factors of that is the foundation. Do you see the Celtic FC Foundation as something that you would like to encourage the players to get more involved with as part of the culture of our club, which is the charitable side of it? Absolutely. I mean, um, uh, 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 to be honest, I think um, for anyone who, who, who has the privilege of coming through this football club and, and being in any role, um, you miss a great opportunity to, to, to really learn and... and enrich your own life by understanding the, the origins and the culture of, of this football club. I'll certainly be doing that. I mean, I, you know, as you said, you know, I wrote in my book, for me, football's not just, it's not just a sport. It's well beyond the sport. For me, it's been a, a kind of vehicle that's steered my life. You know, all my 
most significant relationships have come out of football one way or another, whether it's friendships, uh, any other relationships I've had. So um, I understand that it, it's more than just, this is more than just the club. So I would be encouraging players, staff, anyone who's involved in that football club to, to, to get to know and understand the, the rich history that exists and because it, it enriches your own life. So, um, yeah, but if I, I'll certainly be encouraging uh, the footballers and um, to get involved and I'll certainly, um, as I said, be getting involved myself. Um, yeah, we, sometimes it's difficult because there's always um, the priorities in life in general and, and you know, to understand that, uh, you know, a player who, who represents his football club knows the pressures of having to win and be successful. Um, I think it helps them if they also understand um, what's important to our football club. And it's not just winning. I know everyone wants to win, but I think this, for this football club, it's more than just winning. And I think once you understand that, it actually it, it relieves some of that pressure because you, you, you kind of understand what you're representing. So, um, so certainly I'll be encouraging as much as I can. Thanks a lot and good luck. Thank you. It's Jason for the homeboys here. Uh, just and just what I say, the light that you're hearing buzzing. Uh, see you get going. Obviously, we've done our research, and uh, you come across as a kind of Marcelo Bielsa type, and I just can't wait to see it happen in the flesh. Uh, so just everybody here, hundred percent behind you, and as everybody said before, but the learned gentleman there said it right at the start. I echo every words. They know your friends up there. We're your friends. So, no questions to you, mate, just buzzing to see you. I've got a kind of two-pointed question to yourself, Dom, and again, thanks for putting this on. Totally appreciate it with the fan engagement, etc. So, obviously, the past couple of years recruitment, it's been a bit of a shambles, to be honest with you. And a couple of years ago, with 19 either return loanees, loanees, or signings coming in, and six, possibly seven, had an impact in the first team. Last year we had 14 and only one had a real impact, like David Turnbull. So have you got lessons learned from the previous regime that you're obviously going to work on? And the second part of it is Ange going to have the ultimate final say in the signings coming in, whether it's the backroom staff or whether it's the players, because I think that's what we all want. We don't want somebody working under constraints. So look, um, it'd be fair to say that I've, Received quite a lot of reports on how things have gone over the last number of years. Um, recruitment's one, one area, which of course I've seen reports on. And I maybe said earlier on, it's really critical for, for this club to make sure it's world class and make sure it looks around the world um, to benchmark itself. Um, and that's what we're gonna be doing, whether it's recruitment, whether it's academy, whether that's on business operations, whatever it might be, to make sure we're benchmarking ourselves against the, the best in class. So we want to definitely evolve that. So the lessons about in the past, of course, you'll, you'll learn from those. But really, I want to learn the lessons of other successful and similar-sized uh, yep. clubs across the world. And there's good examples of those, be it Seville or Brentford or whatever it might be. So we're, we're looking at all of that just now. Your, your question about making sure that people with authority make the right decisions, I, I said to Ange when, when we first spoke, I said, it's in my interest to make, and my interest being everyone's interest, the club's interest, to make sure he's as successful as he possibly can be. So he gets a blank canvas in terms of appointing the people that he needs around him. And that extends to making sure that we together work to get the best possible talent through the academy, the best possible talent in from overseas if that's required, or in from, or in from the UK. So that collaboration is gonna be absolutely critical, but the manager's the guy that's gonna be picking the team and making sure he puts his style on that pitch. So he's pivotal to everything that we do in terms of football recruitment. Thanks very much for that. That's the answer I was looking for. Thank you. Hi, Ange. This is Tino from the Celtic Exchange podcast. Um, welcome to Glasgow. Welcome to Celtic. And we wish you all the best with everything you do here. Tom, welcome to you as well. I know you're more familiar, but welcome and, and best of luck. And like all the guys in here, we've done a lot of research on your style, your philosophy, your, you know, your thinking. And what I'd like to know, you know, we've, we've obviously gathered a lot of information, but is there any information or anything that's often misunderstood about you or that people often get wrong about you? Um, it depends. I don't know. It depends who you're listening to, I guess. I mean, um, uh, 
the one thing I, I always fall back on is because, you know, and you'll hear managers kind of talk about their philosophy and the way they want to play. I've always relied on people who watch my teams, you know. That's where you'll get your best information because it's easy for me to say I want my teams to score goals and I want my teams to play a certain way, but that's where, you know, I, I spoke about my father and that he was my critic. He's the only person I've ever listened to my whole life and he was never happy. So I could win things and he'd say, no, you could play more attacking. And, and um, I don't think there's... I mean, hopefully, you know, you, you guys will get to know me over the next sort of period of, of time in terms of the kind of person I am. But I have really strong values on, on not just about football, but in life in general. Um, I, all those values are, are deeply rooted in, in the values my father passed on to me. Um, we were immigrants to another land. We didn't know the language. We didn't know a soul. And yet somehow my father managed to forge a life and an opportunity for me that 55 years later I'm halfway around the world living my dream. Um, that's the person I am and that'll never change. And, um, you know, you may hear various reports. Uh, they say I come across as fairly grumpy at times and, and not very sociable. I'm, I'll, I'll be fair, I'm not the most sociable person. I tend to be pretty quiet, not say too much, but... Um, there are some things that will always ring true about me and that is that um, there are certain things that I believe in that will never waver. As I said, right now I'm, I'm manager of this football club and everything I will do uh, in actions and in words will be to, to protect this football club and to uphold its values, its traditions and hopefully, as I said, bring some special moments that you guys, I'm sure you're all many generation supporters, you're not you know, you're not supporters of the last two, three years that I'm hoping you pass on to your kids and talk about the time that I was here. So that's who I am. Um, I'm, my wife will tell you I'm pretty simple, one-dimensional. I'll watch football day and night. I've got two young kids that drive me nuts. So um, I, from that point of view, there's nothing um, too mysterious about me. Yeah, thanks, Angie, and good luck. Thank you. Tom, for yourself, a few of the guys have spoken about recruitment. Um, with Angie's contacts in Australia and Asia, will that be a part of the world that you're tapping into in terms of some of the potential recruits? Definitely. We wanted to leave no stone left unturned in terms of um, bringing talent into the club or bringing talent to the club. I sort of jokingly said to Angie, I'd love to get the next Nakamura over to, to Scotland. Um, so, look, I, I think we've got... You can still get Nakamura. He's playing. He's 43, so, I think. Yeah, he's 43. <laughs> So look, I, I think absolutely, why would you not want to tap into that experience? But we've got a, a wealth of experience across the global sort of Celtic family, whether through our formal scouting network or our informal scouting network. So our challenge, as I said earlier on, is to make sure we bed Ange in, give him the support that he needs and that the team needs, and then look to evolve all of our structures. And I guess we will leave no stone left unturned to make sure we've got the best structure to make sure this team, this club, is a club that we all continue to be greatly proud of. Thanks, Dom, and good luck to you both, guys. Thank you. Hi, guys. Martin from 20 Minute Tims. Um, Ange, and very warm welcome to you, and thanks for having us. In terms of your style of play, you've already spoke about that, but have you got a preferred formation you'd like to start off with, and do you think you can Im implement that before Champions League qualifiers and get your style of play going? Yeah, look, uh, for the most part, you know, my teams kind of play with a, you know, some kind of 4-3-3 formation. But um, the key part of that is it's not so much the formation, it's just the type of footballers that, you know, I need in, this, in certain positions. And that's the work we're doing on, you know, right now is to, you know, the gaps we have in the squad, and there are some gaps, some pretty noticeable ones, is we try and bring in footballers who, you know, will provide the energy, the speed, the technical ability, um, the courage to play the football that I want to. So, you know, there, there might be f sort of little tweaks in, in the formation. It's usually, like I said, a 4-3-3. I love playing with wingers. I love playing with wide men who sort of take people on um, because I think it's it's a great way avenue to goal. Um, but, you know, with what we have at the moment, uh, I think there's a, there's, there's a core group of players there that I see um, can can really develop and, and, and you know, show some real uh, growth in terms of their football just by us changing our way. Um, but there's certainly some gaps there where I'm going to be trying to bring in a certain type of footballer. And as I said, for me, that that involves 
you know, some speed, some energy, um, players willing to take some risks. Um, so those kind of things are important. Good, looking forward to it. And Dom, after what happened earlier in the summer, can you tell us about the process that led to appointing Ange and if he's 100% your man? Oh, he's 100% my man. There's, there's absolutely no doubt about that. I think the sort of process, um, we probably commented that previously. What I can say is when... Um, Having lived in Australia and spent time living in, uh, being out in Jap Japan, particularly more rec most recently, um, he, Ange is well known to me and has been for, for a long time. Um, so when I had the chance to speak to him when the opportunity to, to arose, it was just a great conversation. And you can see from him in terms of his style, his philosophy, his experience, his passion for this club, it was, uh, it was an easy conversation. And it was a, a, great, a great moment when I asked him, you know, we would like you to become the next Celtic football club manager. And there wasn't the slightest hesitation. And that's what I wanted. I wanted a winner, someone that got the club and that wants to go with me in a journey now to really begin to modernise and develop the club in a number of different ways. And I can't wait for us to start. We're going to have a, a busy summer. Of course we are. But the prize here is just to make sure we've got sustained structures that give us the opportunity to have good success. All right, thanks very much and good luck, guys. Thank you. It's uh, Kenny Burns, Celtic Fans TV. Like, <clears throat> like everyone else, uh, welcome. It's great to see a, a, a fresh impetus going into, going into this season. Um, first question for Ange. Ange, we, we do have one of your countrymen here in Tom Rogic. Tom was a really integral player for Celtic two or three years ago. He's found his game time a bit limited for various reasons over the last couple of years. Can you tell us a bit about your relationship with him, how you see him as a player, and, 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 and do you have a confidence that you can revitalise him to back to the levels that he was a couple of years ago? Yeah, no, obviously I know um, um, Tommy very well, and uh, I had him in the national team when I was national team manager, and uh, extremely talented player. Um, yeah, he's, he's one of those players who I think you know, people are happy to pay to watch because he, he can turn... You know, um, some ordinary moments into something special. Um, my understanding is he's had some some problems, particularly with his body, over the last period, um, and and I think that's probably been his biggest challenge. Um, you know, even when I had him in the national team, was uh, you know consistently trying to get him to to a certain level from his body point of view. Um, I haven't had a good chat to him yet, um, so I'll, I'll certainly be doing that with with him and and the rest of the players and. You know, does he fit into the style of football I want to play? Absolutely. Um, but, you know, Tommy knows me better than anyone in that dressing room right now and he knows that um, I treat everyone the same. Um, I, I, I set us off in a certain direction and, and the ones who want to be a part of that are part of that and the ones who maybe can't be or don't want to be then will fall by the wayside. And uh, But he's certainly someone who I'm looking forward to, to working with again. I'm hoping we can get him fit and... and, and and playing the football that I know he's shown here at different times. Um, and I know he can show in, in my style of football because he's already done it with the national team. Thank you. Um, to Dom, you, you arrive here whereby we're in, we've been in a period, a cycle recently of, of selling our best players in recent years. And I think to a certain extent the, the fans accept that within the confines of Scottish football that's something that has to happen. But... Even within Scotland, some, some clubs have managed to avoid that recently by courting external investment, considering share issues. Is that something that we as a club, you as a CEO, are going to look to potentially bring in going forward to fund the rebuild and get, break this cycle that's stunting our growth of, of selling our best players? Well, I, I think um, the, the key thing for us is to assemble the best possible squad and players and coaching team that we can to, to bring success. How we go about doing that, there'll be lots of different ways that we could potentially do that. Finance is one element of that. Also, we spoke with Brian earlier on about the importance of investing in the academy. Um, I guess one of the challenges, if I go back to my old experience in, in rugby, you know, we, we, we worked really hard there to grow our revenues. We doubled our revenues actually over a five-year period. Um, so I think there's huge potential left still in the tank at Celtic to grow our revenues, both domestically and particularly internationally. And having chaired an international league, I'm quite interested to get to know a little bit more about the operations of the SPFL and, and the SFA and see if they're adding sufficient value into the club. So um, when we spoke earlier on about looking at um, looking under various rocks, um, I'm going to make sure we look under rocks to make sure we've got the right funds, the right investment, the right support to give Ange and ourselves the best chance of that sustained success. Okay, thank you.
Hi, Dom. Hi, Anne. How are you doing? Uh, first question for Dom. Uh, last season was a disaster for a lot of reasons. One of the big issues was communication, uh, such as the kind of January review that led to a lot of protests, exclusives being leaked to the Sun newspaper, which is nothing in common with Celtic. Going forward, how do you make sure the communication coming out of the club is a lot better and a lot more kind of fan-led, essentially? Well, thanks for the question and thanks for coming in today. Today's a good example of that. As maybe mentioned, I'm keen to try and have that engagement on a regular basis. In fact, you know, we've spoken to the, the broadcasters up first, but then we came straight to, to see you all before we even go and do the, the dailies and the Sunday's newspapers. And that hopefully gives a bit of an indication of our level of respect for, for you all. Um, but importantly, this is a club, it's really a big family. And I think the best way for us to make sure that we're all pushing the same direction is to make sure we, we know what, you, what each other think. So engagement's two-way for me. It can't just be about us saying. It also needs to be about us listening as well. So over the next number of months and years, we want to develop that. What's really interesting is that the media environment that we all operate, that you operate in, is completely changing before our eyes. And I think that's something that clubs like Celtic and other clubs and other sports organisations need to be ready to adapt their, their plans to, um, to change along with that changing environment. I spent a lot of time in North American sport, learning about what happens behind the, uh, behind the scenes there. And fan media is a very effective part of sporting franchises. Um, so I think there's some lessons for us to learn from other parts of the world, but I'm keen to make sure that engagement's as meaningful as it possibly can be. Thanks very much and best of luck. A uh, question for Ange. As much as people spoke about a lot of big changes in the club, one of the biggest was our captain has left to join Aberdeen, Scott Brown. He was a massive part of the team and the squad and the club as a whole for 14 years. In terms of yourself, do you plan on bringing in a captain or is the current captain in the squad and what would you look for in a, in a captain? Yeah, as you say, uh, um, you know, Scott um, has had an unbelievable career and, and my understanding, I mean, I... I had an external view, but you know, being in the club now, just what a massive influence he was, both on and off the park. Um, you know, a, a tremendous person and, and character, and always looked after the interests of, of the football club. So, um, but I guess everyone's journey comes to some sort of end, and um, you know, he's looking at the next chapter of his career. Uh, that provides, I guess, opportunity now, um, and that can come from within uh, because. I've always felt when when you know people like a, a Scott Brown leave a club, then there's a vacuum. But maybe that also is an opportunity for somebody else to step up who m may at different times have felt um, not comfortable being in that role. Um, so, you know, I think there's some people within the club that I think show some leadership qualities. Um, but again, I'll, I'll take my time making that decision. I, I want to see because obviously the environment's going to be different now. You know, as a different manager, we're going to do things differently. Um, as I said, I'm pretty strong on, on certain values and certain ways of doing things. So, you know, I'll find the person who, who fits those values. And um, if that's in the football club, and I hope it is because, you know, again, I've always felt that, um, you know, people within a football club who spend some time have a stronger attachment, understand the club better than bringing in somebody externally. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, if, if that person exists there, I'll, I'll identify it and... and and because it is an important role, um, you know, making the leader of our football club. Magic, thanks very much. Best of luck. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, guys. James Forrest, the Celtic blog. Uh, first question to Ange. Um, a lot of us believe that there was a, a general fall in standards in terms of training and coaching in the last two years. Um, I think most of us would like to know that you're committed to sports science, to analytics, and to all like the, you know, modern modes of thinking and coaching. And um, we've also lost a lot of youth players. A lot of really, really promising talent has left their academy and gone abroad or whatever. And I'm thinking that one of the reasons why the board likes you so much in terms of your coaching background is that you've worked with youth players and you've helped develop them and they're far better players. And hopefully you can help us arrest... The, um, the outward movement of our mm. youth stars? Uh, most definitely. Um, you know, the one challenge I've had sort of being on the other side of the world where, uh, you know, to be fair, people don't rate the football that great. Um, but I always try to get an edge any way I could. So when I was coaching the Australian national team and we were at a World Cup and we were playing against the Netherlands and they've got, you know, Van Persie and Robin up front and we've got, 
you know, players who are playing at that level, where could we get our edge? Our edge was in sports science. Our edge was in analytics. Um, you know, I'm... And it's not my domain, it's not my expertise. I struggle with Zoom. That's as bad as I get. Um, so I came through an education system with a pen and paper. So, But I've, I've been smart enough along the way to know that if I get the best people around me in those areas, it definitely gives you an edge. And it's where football, where sport's going in general. I think it's where life's going in general. Um, that's going to be a massive part. So when, it, when, when sort of people talk to me about the staff changes and they tend to focus on the coaching aspect, which I understand, but... The coaching aspect, I'm totally comfortable with. I, I, I've, I've been doing it for 25 years. I know that space. For me, I want to look at the other areas of the club uh, in terms of the football department, those areas that you've mentioned, and make sure we're absolutely uh, best practice. Um, that's where I want us to have an edge over everyone else because if you have even a 1% advantage over your opponent before the game starts because of your preparation, the information you're given, the way you've prepared your players, then gives you a better chance of success. So uh, it's definitely going to be part, a huge part of what I'm trying to build in the club. And in terms of young players, I've already said that I, I just think it's, it's so, so important that, um, you know, one, we were able to identify the best young talent, two, to give them the opportunity, and three, to keep them at our football club. Um, it's, it's the best possible story if you can grab a kid off the terrace who's eight or nine years old with a Celtic scarf and see him run out here um, as a senior player one day because that means everybody in that stadium knows his journey. So um, it's a massive part of, again, you know, what I'll be focusing on. Thank you very much, mate. Thank you. Dom, hi, how are you doing? Um, you're, you're coming into a, a club right now that needs uh, an enormous rebuild structurally. And it's, it's really interesting hearing you talk today about um, a clean slate, as it were. Um, it's, it's obvious that, that some of the ideas that were being put in place no longer are, and there is a lot of change going on behind the scenes. Celtic isn't the only organisation you'll be involved with that needs reformed. Now, you've dealt with the SFA in terms of Hamden, and um, when there was discussion about moving international fixtures and cup finals to Murrayfield. So you know that the SFA is an anarchic and, frankly, not fit for purpose organisation. A lot of us think that Celtic have missed several opportunities to reform the way the SFA works and the way it works for Scottish football. Um, namely, financial fair play regulations, fitting for proper persons, um, the way clubs are financed and how the SFA reviews that, uh, refereeing. <laughs> there are a lot of areas in which the SFA needs a good clear out. A lot of us feel the opportunities have been missed. How engaged are you going to be and can you give us some commitments in those areas and others? That's a big question. Um, thank you for it. Um, so my background uh, most recently has been involved with running a governing body, a big running, governing, governing body, and transforming it, going on a real journey with it in terms of professionalizing it and perhaps making it less archaic. Um, and I've also had the great joy of being a director and chairman of a league, a cross-border international league, um, and sitting on the board of a, a, a number of other uh, organizations that are involved with high-performance sport. So I think I've got a good understanding of the challenges that any governing body might face or any league might face. So hopefully my experience in that regard um, can be put to good use to make sure that we evolve and support the evolving elements of football in Scotland. My real focus is Celtic. Yeah. My sole focus is making sure this club is putting a smile in everybody's face again. Indeed. And we do that in a great way. But to do that, we're going to need to have a bit more influence in shaping some of the other parts of the, the football environment. So we're really interested in that. But what I would say is that the welcome that I've had here from the Celtic family the welcome that I've had from other clubs has been really positive because I think they perhaps see me as someone that's coming with a, a different perspective and a keenness to try and affect some change. So um, step by step, um, let's focus on making sure Celtic's as strong as it can be. But at the same time, as, as Ange mentioned earlier on, we'll, we'll back Celtic as hard as we possibly can. Thank you very much, mate. Hi guys, uh, Hamish from 67 Hail Hail. Um, just to welcome both of you to the club, obviously a, a lot of work ahead of both of you, so all the best. Um, Ange, I'll start with you. 
Obviously, like everyone in this room, we wanted to, to find out as much as we could about you. Um, we spoke to Vince Regari from your homeland. I think you know he had a lot of positive things to say. Um, one thing he did raise was the fact that uh, your teams can take some time to get used to your way of playing, your philosophy, and um, just the, the overall kind of ethos. Is that something you think is a, a fair comment? And how far do you think this uh, Celtic side you inherited are from where you want them to be? Yeah, look, I, I mean, people always sort of say that, that, you know, it takes time, but, I mean, I, I, I assume everyone wants to be successful. They all like the ending, so I, I think if you talk to people I've actually been involved with, none of them really talk about how long it took. They just talk about the fact that it was, you know, a special time. So I, I don't put time frames on that, that thing, those things. Um, sometimes it happens quickly. Sometimes it takes a, a little bit more time. There's no doubt you're not going to see in the first game, first Champions League game, the team flying the way I want to. But at the same time, um, it's not to say that we can't make significant pro progress quickly. Uh, m my goal is to have this club playing football that's going to excite every one of you and we're going to be successful. Um, I can't say how that story is going to be written. Like most great stories, there's going to be some twists and turns, a little bit of unknown. That's the exciting bit. I can't tell you it's going to take a month, two months, six months. What I do know is that um, whenever I've committed to the task and, and, and um, that's been at every club I've been in, uh, the ending's been the way it should be. So... Every day I'm going to work hard to make sure it's as quick as possible. Um, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to take shortcuts. I'm not going to um, compromise what I'm saying and what I believe be just to win a game, because ultimately I want us to be the very best. So I'm not going to compromise on that. Um, so I can't tell you how long it's going to take. Um, I will tell you that we will get there. Great. Thanks very much, um, Dom. The one word I've heard you saying, uh, you know numerous occasions is uh, modernisation and um, you know modernising the club and um, you said I think when Andrew was appointed that, that both of you kind of share that that view just specifically what areas do you feel at Celtic are in need of modernisation and, and how do you intend to, to go about that? Thanks Hamish um, I think every element of uh, the, the club needs to make sure it remains as professional as slick and as world-class as it should be, we operate in a high performance environment. Um, we want to make sure that we've got the best possible tools and people and processes at our disposal. So every part of the organization I'm gonna to wanna to make sure is ready for the next 10 years. And that's my mission. Um, having done that pretty much in, in rugby, transformed that with a great team across there, I wanna make sure we've got a brilliant, brilliant foundation here at Celtic, unbelievable foundation. But I wanna make sure that we are ready for the next 10 years. And Ange mentioned earlier on that, whether it's in data analytics, whether it's in recruitment, whether that's an engagement, whether that's on investment in facilities, whether it's up at Lennox Town or Barrowfield here at the stadium, I want to make sure that we are ready for the next 10 years and that we're surprising and delighting people along the way. Um, but it's a, it's a journey. I don't, to Andrew's point about the business and the, the, the overall club responsibility, we can't take shortcuts. So we've got to do things right, and that's my point. We just do things methodically and sensibly to make sure we're ready for, for the next decade. And I think people are really believing in that. People really recognise that there, perhaps a moment has, has passed for us now to go again and go hard. Um, I got the numbers for the season tickets just as I wandered through the door earlier on, and they're off the scale good in terms of where I thought they were going to be. So that's a huge thank you to, to everybody that's once again bought season tickets. Um, and I cannot wait to welcome them all back to Celtic Park. I was explaining to Ange over the last sort of few weeks what it's like at Celtic Park on a match day, a particular European match day, it's special. So I, I cannot wait for him to experience that, for our players to experience that, and even more importantly, for you all to experience that to come back out. So we're going to keep modernising in a number of different ways, methodically and sensibly, but we'll do that together. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Cheers. Hi guys, John from Gigpod here. Thanks for inviting us. Uh, Dom, my question's for you first. Can you give us an update on the process about getting fans back into the stadium? As you said, I think the fans are going to be desperate to get back. That was maybe one of the reasons, not an excuse why we were so poor last season, but have you got an update on the process for that and how soon maybe fans will be back for next season? So we're very active in that regard. Uh, look, 
two and a half hours ago, I was in a call with the government just talking specifically about bringing um, supporters back into Celtic Park. I've got some more meetings tomorrow on this subject. Um, we are in good shape. Um, you probably also saw the announcement from the First Minister just last week in terms of social distancing potentially being reduced and then disappearing during August. Um, we are already in, in a level system where you can get up to sort of 2,000 into, into Celtic Park. But both Ange and I were fortunate enough to be at the England game down in Wembley where we had 22,500 people into Wembley. And Hamden, of course, has had 12,500 into Wembley. Tomorrow I'll be at, at Rugby just looking at the facilities. I'm not going back, but looking at the facilities. But they've got 16,500 in at Rugby. So if it's good enough for Hamden, it's good enough for Murrayfield, it's good enough for Wembley, it's certainly good enough for Celtic Park. So we'll be working really hard with the government and the city to get as many supporters back in as we possibly can for that, for that European game. Um, and I'm, I'm comforted by the direction of travel that the, the, the country's going in at the moment in respect of the First Minister's announcement just last week. And Andrew, a question for you. As, as Dom says, you attended the Scotland-England game, but Cal McGregor was fantastic. And you also played well for Scotland all night, scoring that goal. How impressed were you with him? And have you had a chance to talk to him yet about the role he'll play next season? Yeah, no, I was, I was very, very impressed with, uh, with Callum. Um, you know, just watching him live at, at, at Wembley was fantastic. Um, you know, he, he put in an incredible shift. And, um, you know, it was great the other night too, scoring the goal. And um, just seeing him, uh, you know, he, he seemed to grow in stature as the, the tournament went on with every game. He felt more and more sort of comfortable and... Um, yeah, I mean, I sent him a text message wishing him all the best and, and, and congratulating him as well. And, um, you know, I can't wait to get him back into camp and, and sort of back into the club and, and get him training because I think more than anything else, he will feel really good about himself coming from that tournament and that energy that he, he got from that and the positive. And I'm sure he wants more of it, you know. He, he's he's now played at, at a major tournament and in world football and... I'm sure he wants to experience more on that and, and I'm sure he wants to take Celtic up to those levels. So I can't wait to get him back in and, and all the other national team lads, I think. Um, I can only see it as a positive the experience they've had and um, you know, I look forward to welcoming him, welcoming him back down to Lennox Town and, 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 and getting him back into training. Thanks, guys. Good luck next season. Thank you. Can I just sort of say a, a huge thank you to everyone? Um, you guys have had a very long lockdown. You've been away from this wonderful stadium, so it's great to have you back in today. Um, thank you for the support that you've given to Ange and you've given to me. Um, we promise that we're going to work extremely hard to, to make you happy and smile, and uh, it's, great to, it's great to be back moving positively forward, so thank you very much. Best press conference ever. Yeah. <laughs>